So next we're going to have uh, Scott Tarot and Chris Leonard. And uh, I'll let Chris introduce Scott, but first I want to introduce Chris. Chris is an author of a really excellent book called The Meat Racket, which came out last year. And it's about consolidation in the meat industry in the United States. It's a really scary book, uh, but you should all read it. And he's working now on a book on the Koch brothers and how they actually make their money. But uh, I'll turn it over to Chris. Yeah, thanks, Barry. Appreciate it. Uh, the Meat Racket's a fun read. Please, don't, don't be intimidated by it. So uh, thank you so much. It's really great to be here uh, with Scott Turow, uh, not just because I love his books and have read them for a long time, but I think Scott can give us a really great what I'd call maybe an author's eye view of what the book industry looks like today, how it's changed, uh, particularly since the advent of, of Amazon, and what that means just more broadly. I mean, more than just folks uh, making a living by publishing books, but what it means for our, our culture, our country, our society. Um, Scott has published 11 books. Ten of them are bestsellers which, you know, kind of makes me hate you a little bit, so I'm just kidding. It's an incredible track record. They're really wonderful books. And uh, he's also an attorney, uh, was an, uh, a federal prosecutor, yeah. and uh, head of the Authors Guild. So you have sort of a view of the situation from, from all perspectives, and thank you so much for being here to talk about it. I, I guess what I, I'd like to ask you to, to start off is, you know, Presumed Innocent, your first novel, came out in 1987. Right. And you've been in this business ever since then. I'd imagine you've seen some changes in, in the overall economy around books. Lots. What have you seen during your time? Well, actually, the first book I published was in 1977 while I was still a law student, and it was a book called 1L about my experiences as a law student. And uh, at the time that 1L came out, um, the Harvard Bookstore and Harvard Square did this really amazing thing, and they discounted copies. Uh, I wasn't even sure it was legal, but um, it certainly was beneficial to me. And when you hear from people like Doug Preston and me, it's, I, I always like to emphasize that um, we, are, we, we are not um, trying to make our own lives uh, better or easier or richer. Um, the fact of the matter is that most of the changes that have taken place in uh, in the literary world, whether it was uh, book discounting or the emergence of the book chains or then Amazon, are immensely beneficial to best-selling authors because best-selling authors uh, get paid, uh, especially when we're talking about physical books, on the basis of the retail cover price and your royalty represents a part of that. And so the cheaper the bookseller makes the books, the more copies are going to be sold, the more uh, the person lucky enough to refer to her or himself as a best-selling author, the more we make. The reality for me is that Amazon has been great for me. Um, they've sold tens of thousands of copies of my books, probably hundreds of thousands of copies of my books. I, uh, I don't object to their effect uh, in the literary world for my own sake. I object to, to it because they are, as I have called them, the Darth Vader of the literary world. They have not been overall a force for good. Now, you, you can't, you, you know, you paint with a broad brush and obviously there are ways uh, in which Amazon has been helpful. And certainly the fact that uh, they have lowered uh, book prices uh, to the consumer, as far as the Justice Department, it's a good thing. The question is, how did they get there and how did they do it and what is the damage that they're doing to the, to the literary ecology? I don't think, uh, personally, that you get very far um, in this country objecting to the outcomes that the free market uh, produces. What's important to me about what Amazon has done is whether their conduct is really uh, consistent with a free market. No one denies, no one, uh, the, if somebody from the Department of Justice was here today, they would not deny that Amazon is a monopoly. And as Doug said, uh, this, the idea that 
um, you would tolerate a monopoly in uh, the marketplace for books is by itself controversial. Uh, books and authors have a special place in this democracy, which is enshrined in the Constitution, in Article I, Section 8, uh, which instructed the Congress to make laws to secure to authors for a limited time uh, their copyrights. Uh, and the basis, of the reason for that was that the founders had a view that the rich discussion that's supposed to take place in a democracy would be best promoted by having an independent authorial class, not beholden to the government, to universities, to private patrons, but supported by their readers. So if, if you say that, that books are literally a matter of constitutional stature uh, and fundamental to the operation of the democracy, the idea of allowing any entity to develop a chokehold over, uh, over that enterprise is by itself, um, it's, it's very strange. Um, but uh, my, as a member of the Authors Guild Board and president of the Guild, um, you know, we began to object to what Amazon was doing uh, years ago when they started selling used books mm -hmm. uh, at the same time they were selling new books. Um, the problem, of course, uh, is that by selling the used book side by side with the new book, uh, neither the author nor the publisher uh, who have an investment uh, in, uh, in that book uh, are allowed to recoup it. And uh, like a lot of things that Amazon has done, they were simply, yes, it was lawful, uh, but the laws were never intended to promote that kind of a result. Um, the, but for me, the place where I really got off the boat was with what Amazon did when they introduced the Kindle. And they began, they got publishers to agree that uh, their e-books, their Kindle books, could be released at the same time that um, hardcover books were uh, by promising the publishers to pay them the same thing that they would earn on a hardcover book. Um, all well and good until the publishers found out that Amazon was then going to sell ebooks at a loss, mm. uh, a loss of somewhere between two and five dollars on every title. Now, um, in my view, uh, I don't claim to be an antitrust expert, but that's where the Justice Department should have stepped in. Uh, because by selling at a loss, Amazon was able to permanently, and as it turned out, forever distort the market for books in this country. They um, were driving the market toward the ebook at the cost of physical books. Uh, and they weren't doing it by honest competition, they were doing it by selling at a predatory price. By doing that, they foreclosed other competitors from entering the market because very few commercial entities uh, in this society have the remarkable relationship that Amazon has had with Wall Street, which has been willing to prop up the company for 20 years now, even though they've barely earned a profit. And you have to say to yourself, why would they be doing this? And if anybody thinks that the people on Wall Street are not expecting monopoly profits out of Amazon sooner or later, then you really haven't been pay paying attention to what goes on in this country. Um, Wall Street is not doing this because they simply favor lower consumer prices. Uh, that is not, that's not what the motive is. So, but Amazon was allowed to sell at a loss resulting in the closure of thousands of physical bookstores uh, in this country. One of the things that bothers me the most is if you look at the way books, and especially e-books, frequently get bought in this country, people will go into a physical store, they will pick up the books, at least if you're lucky enough to live in a place where physical stores exist, which in many middle-sized cities in this country, they're, they're not there anymore. But they'll go in, they'll look at a physical book, and then they'll literally take out their, uh, their cell phone and order the book most often from Amazon. Now, this, this, 
that state of affairs exists because bookstores were essentially foreclosed from ever entering this business because hard pressed by what Amazon was doing to them in the sale of physical books, they could hardly turn around and lose two to five dollars every time they sold an ebook. So they never got into the market. And this, you know, the, the only significant player here um, for a long time was Barnes and Noble, and they were hemorrhaging money trying to compete with Amazon because they don't have the same support. So um, what is the effect of all of this? The effect on all of this is that publishers, as Doug said, can publish fewer books, uh, and you know, the margins are under threat. In the meantime, Amazon expands and becomes a publisher itself, and it is clear, as one of the publishers said to me um, a couple of years ago, Amazon aims to clear the field of anyone who stands between Amazon and the reader. And when there is no one left, it is entirely predictable that the cost to the reader will go up. Uh, in the interval, the people that they are going to press and press hard will be authors. And to some extent, that started already. Yeah, and that's the, the oldest playbook for monopolies, right? They clear the field and then prices rise. It's happened again and again over history. And I think what, what readers don't often see is, is that process that happens behind the bookstore shelf of actually creating a book and, and bringing ideas to market. And I don't think any authors really get into this business thinking it's going to make them rich, but there was this sort of marketplace that supported writers to the degree they could eat and live in a crummy house and at least produce their books. You talk to a lot of authors. I was wondering if you could just you know, describe for us what's happened to that marketplace most people don't see where new writers with new ideas are trying to get an advance that might support them for a short amount of time uh, and, and the sort of place that produces new ideas and new books. Well, it's, you know, it's increasingly difficult to become published uh, as a new author and, as, and especially as a new author who is not uh, in one of the niches, niches that continue to sell well. And uh, I have a daughter who, uh, what other, what, possessed by what madness, I don't know, uh, has decided to become a writer. And she did her MFA in New York City. And I was talking to her about this. And she said to me, oh, dad, she said, none of my friends think they'll be able to make a living as a writer. Now, when I went to graduate school in creative writing 30 years before that, um, it turned out, of course, that many of my friends weren't able to make livings as writers either, but they didn't know it going in. Oh. Um, and uh, the, the situation now is that any rational person looks at this landscape and says, unless you know, I'm lucky enough to be a Doug Preston or a Scott Turow or probably two or three other, two or three hundred other authors in this country, um, you're not going to make a living doing that. What, what about this notion that Amazon itself will solve that problem, that you can self-publish and that it removes this terrible uh, gatekeeper function of these mean publishers in New York that were only stifling creativity, and that Amazon is going to be the, the pathway to self-publishing? Well, uh, first of all, I'm happy to see more books published. Uh, I'm happy to see independent publishing take place. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't decry it at all. Um, but it is, I mean, it reminds me of the wars between, you know, the lower classes. Uh, publishers are hard pressed by Amazon. They can't afford to publish uh, new authors. And new authors hate because they've worked hard and they've written good things and they can't get them published. Uh, and so they say, well, Amazon's great and the publishers are bad. Whereas in point of fact, the whole system uh, that Amazon has created is what is punishing those new authors. And the notion that Amazon, when it takes control of this marketplace, operates in a benevolent way toward those uh, so-called independent authors is also foolhardy. Amazon fixes prices for these independent books. If you want the 70% royalty that Amazon uh, promises, then you have to price the book in accordance with Amazon's notions of where the book ought to be priced. You cannot sell for less than $2.99. You cannot sell for more than $9.99. Why the Justice Department does not think that this is an unacceptable practice is beyond me. 
Just, it's just beyond me. Um, but independent authors have watched Amazon um, already begin to cannibalize their incomes with their uh, subscription service, you know, Kindle Unlimited, uh, which has these mysterious pooled earnings that Amazon alone uh, decides at the beginning of the month. Uh, and the independents uh, who've been lucky enough to succeed have watched their earnings plummet. So um, they, they really are you know, kissing the dragon uh, and, and, of course, not aware of it. And the one action we have seen by the Department of Justice was against Apple and some of the publishers that were trying to stand up a competitor to Amazon in, in the iPad. And yes, you could argue they colluded because they talked to each other, but, but Amazon itself, as you're saying, is fixing prices, clearly selling at a loss to wipe out competitors. You know, you, are, you were a prosecutor uh, in Chicago. Why do you think we're not seeing more, more action to, to keep this business competitive? Well, I mean, it, you know, there's a school of legal theory called the legal realists who said that basically all jurisprudence is fundamentally political. Um, and if you want to see that notion uh, writ large, then you should look at what happens with antitrust doctrine. And, um, you know, things like vertical integration, which I was taught in law school when I took antitrust class, was per se illegal. Um, has been uh, embraced. That one the Republicans liked. Now we have a Democratic administration that thinks that you know the, the low prices are uh, a, a, you know a creature of godliness. Um, so it, it will change. Um, antitrust doctrine changes more than any other uh, facet of the law that I know of. The problem is that when that change occurs. Um, and when you talk to people in the Department of Justice, they have all kinds of fantasies about how Facebook will, will end up selling books instead. Um, the, it, it, it's, you know, it's all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. If you wipe out the book selling ecology that has existed in this country uh, for more than a century, uh, then what's going to be left when all of a sudden they say, oh, Amazon, they really are Darth Vader, mm -hmm. uh, and they've got to change their ways. And then the argument will be, well, there's no other way to get books. You know, the last Barnes & Noble in Washington, D.C. closed a few weeks ago, which is so utterly depressing. I'm just going to say it as a reader, not to be able to walk into a physical space and see those books. And so I think your point is, is dead on that we're losing an infrastructure that is not going to be easy to replace at all. Um, do you please leave us with some glimmer of hope? I mean, do you see any, any actions out there now that people are at least waking up to this, or, or there might be some sort of cop on the beat um, that could, could help move this back in a direction of more competition and more pathways uh, for ideas to get out there to readers? You know, uh, if, if, you know, Frank Four and I did a debate, an Intelligence Squared debate, and. We were lucky enough to debate in New York, and the question was, is Amazon the reader's friend? And we won in New York. I wouldn't have wanted to hold a debate in Seattle. Hmm. Um, but there is, there is some awareness that this, this chokehold over the marketplace of American ideas cannot be good uh, for all of us. And, um, you know, and there will always be books. Books will always be written. Um, some people will be able to make a living doing it. Um, but the question is whether the constitutional vision is being fulfilled, fulfilled by um, what is going on with Amazon, among other players. And um, my answer is absolutely not. And unless there's something coming over the horizon I don't see, um, it, it's going to be a while before that changes. Wow. I, I wish we could talk longer, but we have to keep on schedule. So Good. thank you so much for being here and all your hard work in this space. Great. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.